everybody got a poster. Everybody, everybody has a poster now. So if you wanted to get one, you got one. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk down the history of time here. We're gonna go, we're gonna go back to the beginning here. Let me move the lighting just a little bit. Because I do wanna start back here. I, I, I do want I do want to start all the way back here. I want to go all the way back to the beginning. So you should have a poster that looks something similar to mine. It should look it, it, you you should by now there's enough people who have gotten a free one of these that hit the number one button. Where are you guys from? Where's everybody at? <laughs> I sometimes get into my own zone and I just kind of forget. Oh, I'm so dry, aren't I? Forgive me. While I have the step and repeat up, I had to teach a, a college class today. While I had to teach that class today, I had the step and repeat up. And since I have since I have the step and repeat up, what's going on, Kentucky? How are you guys doing? And you should have a digital poster. If you didn't download one, you can download one now. It's on my website. All the codes are posted on my last video. Everybody's doing it, so please just figure out how to get it done and then download your poster. For those of you guys who bought one and sent me in a donation for people who didn't buy them, I'm super, super grateful. I, we have to... I'm going to teach you guys today, and, and a lot of this will be review for a lot of you because I know that this particular crowd is highly educated. So I want to say hello to everybody here, and then let's get right into it so that we don't lag because there is so much information to cover on this poster. That because I have ADHD, and there's there is bound to be something on here that will trigger me, I'm sure you know that, and um, I'll get, I'll lose track. So I have my computer here, I have my computer right here to keep notes of just the things that I want to cover with you guys. So if you guys, oh yeah, I, I don't know, if you guys want to, if you, T-Roy, good to see everybody, if you guys want to um, take a second to get your digital poster out, you can follow along, or we're just going to jump right into the beginning and understanding of the founding of our country and starting to learn our exact first 10 liberties. We're going to get your first 10 big liberties down exactly so that you know what your rights are. So you know what your rights are, that your liberties that, that cannot be infringed. This is super important, right? Because that's all we're seeing is infringement. After Okay, let's jump right into it. So on your poster, I abbreviated down the first 10 amendments so that you guys would be able to just have a simple digestion of it and we could just go over it one by one because if you just talk about them out loud, what happens is you start to learn your liberties better. And so your first liberties, what, what are these first liberties based on? These first liberties are based on, first liberties are based on exactly Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Montesquieu and John Locke. This is what your first liberties are based upon. Right here, right here. So you think the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, but that's not true. It's the layer cake that these three men create. John Locke creates natural law, life, liberty, and property. Jean-Jacques Rousseau creates the social contract. And then Montesquieu says, let's use three branches of government and end slavery. Montesquieu's idea of ending slavery was a novel idea. These two gentlemen, both um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau will talk about slavery in the social contract. But so the philosophies of these men will create our Bill of Rights. What these guys thought and wrote will create the first 10 amendments. Your first amendment is liberty. Your first amendment's based on your big five liberties. And do me a favor, um, everybody just type down in there your first big five liberties. Put in there, you have to know what they are. You have to know them off the top of your head like they are absolute, easy peasy Japanese. And what are they? What are the first five liberties? I'll, I'll wait. I'm gonna wait till, till someone gets it exactly right. It's life, what, first, first big five liberties.
Life, Liberty, Property is John Locke, and your first big five liberties, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of petition, freedom to assemble. Those are your first five big civil liberties that you have to know. The, the, your first big five liberties. You, you have to know them like you know them like you know them because what we're seeing is the First Amendment right to be press is being arrested. We're seeing First Amendment hours be arrested for you violating your First Amendment. So now when you look at this, you should know that your First Amendment is liberty. Your first big five, first big five liberties. Your Second Amendment is the, <laughs> the, the, your right to be armed shall not be infringed. But it's, it's been completely ruined. It's been ruined. Uh, no troops shall be quartered, your Third Amendment. And so we don't really do this anymore. But, but you, then you think about that just for a minute. When you think about your Third Amendment, no, no troops shall be quartered during times of war, it seems as though government has no boundaries to what they would be willing to do to get you to do what they wanted. It's, so I think the Third Amendment has a lot of validity today. I think that they, when they declared martial law over the first outbreak of the bird flu, you know, it, that was pretty crazy all over America to see troops in America. It was absolutely ridiculous. So I think the third, I think the third of, your, of your first 10 civil liberties is big. Now, your Fourth Amendment, as you know, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to need this yet. Your, your, your Fourth Amendment are, are your freedom standards. And your freedom standards, you know, that's what, you know, that to me is the, is the, is the pinnacle of your right. It's the freedom standards is your Fourth Amendment. You have those freedoms. You have the right to be pressed, to assemble, to petition, religion, speech. You have those first five. But the reason why I put right here, the Fourth Amendment is the right of the people. You see, the Fourth Amendment is the right of the people. I mean, that's, that, that's pretty telling, isn't it? When you're talking most, the Fourth Amendment is the right of the people. I mean, that's not really playing a game, is it? That's, that's letting you know it's for you. And then when you get into here, it says, the right to be secure in their person, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, right? Do you see? This, this, this is the very beginning. Hey, Zach, what's up, buddy? This is the very beginning of understanding. Look, person, houses, papers, and effects. What are effects? Effects are your dog. If your dog gets off the leash, that's your effect. That, that's your effect. And so when you get into the freedom standard of the Fourth Amendment, that, that very, very beginning principle, the right to be secure in your person, how be secure in your person, houses, papers, and effects. That's the freedom standards. Those are the standards. Those are the standards. Those are just the basic outline of man that you're born with, given by God. It's not given by a government. The government doesn't say, here's your freedom standards. These are the freedom standards based on what? The freedom standards based on John Locke's philosophy of divine morality. Of divine morality. There's a video I put out on community called Divine Morality by John Locke. And John Locke is going to say, that you have a right to be alive and your body to say that you have a right to be alive and your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God, whether we like it or not. This is the founding enlightenment thinker who created the theory, the, the Lachian theory called natural law. <laughs> he, he, he might deserve a little bit of, of, of respect in, 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 his, in his vision considering that, that that's what creates the foundation for you and I. So the thing about Lachian theory and divine morality, I can't give you Jeffrey Kaplan's lesson on divine morality. I did put it in community. I highly recommend you watch it. It's phenomenal. Uh, uh, anyway, so, so his idea is that your body is, is, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. That's divine morality. Your body belongs to God. And so anything that happens to your body is a crime against God. 
You don't have the right to take that person and throw them in a dungeon. You don't have the right to hurt or abuse that person's body because that body doesn't belong to that person. That body belongs to God. This is divine morality. This is the founding concept of America. And so for that reason, based on Lockean theory of natural law, that your life liberty, your liberty is paramount, then you have the second paragraph of the Fourth Amendment. And what does the second paragraph of the Fourth Amendment say? Let's zoom in tight on this real quick. And no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation. Okay, so no warrant shall issue unless a law has been broken. Probable cause is a law has been broken. Now, throughout the history of our Supreme Court, they have bastardized what probable cause means. Probable cause is very clear what it means here. If you, you don't have to be a Rhodes Scholar here. You don't got to be a scientist. You don't have to be a, a mathematician. It's pretty simple. No warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause, meaning you broke a law, and then supported by oath or affirmation. And so we go back to it. We go back to it. What does John Locke say? What is his principal philosophy? That liberty is far-reaching. That liberty reaches to the end of the world. Liberty is the most important principle. You being free... This is his principles. Hey, I'm not John Locke. I am not as smart as John Locke. I'm not as smart as Hobbes. I'm not as smart as Rousseau. Go ahead and read Rousseau. You're not as smart as Rousseau. If you are, I want to learn more from you. Teach me more. So then you get to, uh, uh, okay, let me, don't let me jump ahead. Don't let me jump ahead. So no warrant shall issue, but upon, no. So, so, so that means that probable cause is you have violated the law. Probable cause, if a warrant can be issued for your arrest, if a warrant can be issued for your arrest, you violated the law. That, that's, that, and that's, that's at a minimum. That's at a minimum why a warrant can be issued for your arrest. Or you, you, we go against the theory of natural law. We go, we go against everything that John Locke's principles of Lockean theory are based on. And particularly, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. Particularly describing. Now, what happened here? What happened here? Terry versus Ohio. Now it is no longer, because Terry versus Ohio puts officer safety over your rights, what Terry versus Ohio does is makes it so that, so that the cop is now the one swearing that he's suspicious of you. And now a warrant's issued for you because he's gonna put you in handcuffs for his safety. Torture cuffs. Oh my God, I don't wanna get off topic here. I wanna, I wanna stay on the timeline. I'm gonna share a video with you guys tomorrow. So, <laughs> This video, this sheriff gets arrested, if you guys haven't seen it. This sheriff gets arrested, and he gets arrested by state police or something, and the whole time he gets arrested, he's complaining about how bad the handcuffs hurt because they're torture, because they're absolutely torture. So now, as we continue down the line here, so these are your basic freedom standards. That, now, and when you put freedom standard, what is a freedom standard? A freedom standard is that no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. Do you see how detailed your freedom standard is? That before you can be taken off to a dungeon, we really got to get it right. And it's got to be supported by oath or affirmation of the victim. And that's why Terry versus Ohio is the most destructive legislation that we must tackle first. Because that allows him to decide that you're bad because he's suspicious of you. Completely against the Fourth Amendment in every single way. So now we continue. Your Fifth Amendment is your right to be your right to remain silent, but your Fifth Amendment is also your right to due process. And due process is going to be mentioned again in the Fourteenth Amendment. It's the only thing mentioned twice in two different constitutional amendments. You, one a civil liberty, the second a civil right. We'll get into that later. But but you see, you have a right to due process in your first your first ten civil liberties. That's not a civil right. Now it's going to be reiterated in the Fourteenth Amendment because. As you know, we're going to get into that as well, but the black people are not, aren't, aren't getting their civil rights respected. So due process is gone. That's why habeas corpus is going to be suspended. But we're going to, we're going to get into that. How's everybody doing? Roll call. Hit the number one, you guys. Let me know where you guys are from. Hit, let me know where you're from. Let me take a drink. You should have your poster out because I'm going to start to go over Supreme Court cases that you guys can mark on your little, you, you can just write right on your, 
on a piece of paper next to it so you start to learn the Supreme Court cases. I'm gonna teach you a bunch of stuff. Just as, I, I have the setup here, so let's just walk through the poster. Everybody should have a poster. It's good to see everybody. Thank you guys for coming by St. Louis. As you guys know, I cannot get lost in the, the, the comments or I won't be able to think straight. So there's good to see everybody. Good to see everybody. Thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad we have this chance to go over these things because they're super important. So I'm, I'm going to show you guys something and I'm going to, I'm going to read you guys something from Wexler law that I, that I just wanted to, to have to reiterate to you how important the fifth amendment of the United States is for you to have the right to remain silent and to get due process of the law. Uh, the constitution states, only one command twice. The Fifth Amendment says to the federal government that no one shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The 14th Amendment ratified in 1868 used the same 11 words called the Due Process Clause to describe a legal obligation of all states. These words have their central promise an assurance on all levels of American soil. So, so do you see, you have a right to due process. So when I, when I get some stories where people are, are, and by the way, I'm getting all your stories and stuff. Remember, I'm only one man. I can only go so, do, do so many things, but there's so many of you who've been hammered. I'm sorry. I hope you're getting due process of the law. So now you're, you're I'm going to read this to you. So right here. So in your Sixth Amendment, you have the right to face your accuser. You, you have the right to face your accuser in, in all criminal prosecutions. The accused shall ha enjoy the right to speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to inform the nature and the clause of the accusations. You see, this, this, is what the sixth, this is what the Sixth Amendment does for you. It gives you the right to be, to be called before the right county. And this is a misprint. I actually sent it to the printer wrong. It's $20. Sorry. <laughs> it, it, you get a right to a jury trial with anything over $20 of damage or, or stolen. And then the Eighth Amendment is your right to not have cruel and unusual punishment and excessive fines. And then your Ninth Amendment is unenumerated rights. You have rights that are not yet listed here. And it's my assertion that we, we, we have a Ninth Amendment right to sue this Supreme Court because we don't have representation. These people are completely out of touch from you and me. Clarence Thomas right now, his last six, eight rulings, he is nuts. He has nothing in common with his peers. He's the, the just the most off, his wife is doing crazy things. It's just insane that this person is appointed for life. If you guys don't know what's going on with Clarence Thomas and his wife, just put it into Google. It's insane. This person is appointed to our constitutional rights. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a political position. Just Google it. Look up what Clarence Thomas is doing with his wife so I can stand focused to the history lesson here because we're going to walk down these cases because that's why I gave everybody a poster so you would understand the foundation of how we got here. And so I'll give you guys this real quick. Riddle me this, Batman, and riddle me that. Let's get to the Tenth Amendment, and then I'll give you that riddle. And remind me, you guys, remind me. Let me, let me know that you want to be reminded, okay? So I want to read this one to you so that you guys really understand. Oh, wow. There's stuff on here that I, just, I have so much to cover on here. This is, holy smokes. There's just so much to cover. There really is. I put, a, I put so much information on this and I'm going to teach it to you a piece at a time so that you can go back and look at your poster and, and remember what we talked about. And so, and so now we move forward. Now the, now the Tenth Amendment is the power designated to the, to the, to the Constitution. I'm sorry about that. I'm going I'm to read. The power delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by the states. It also reserves the state's respectively to the people. I read that terribly. Let me give it to you again. These powers include the powers to declare war, to collect taxes, 
to regulate interstate commerce, business activities, and others that are listed in the articles. Any power not listed here that the federal government has says the 10th Amendment is to be left to the states or the people. So, so they, because of the 10th Amendment, every president that ever goes into office, he has the right to declare war. He can declare war. Now, it also says here in the 10th Amendment, it gives the federal government the right to collect taxes. It gives the federal government the right to collect taxes. I mean, I had a really stimulating conversation today, and, and it, it says in the charter of our Constitution, I'm, listen, I'm only going by the literature. I'm only going by what I know and what I've read. And, and so when you start ha having the argument of taxes or theft, I mean, I didn't write this stuff. I just put it on a cool poster so you guys would enjoy it and show the kids and they'd be able to learn. But look, these powers include the power to declare war, to collect taxes, to regulate interstate business activities and others that are listed in the articles. Any power not listed here in the 10th Amendment is left to the states or to the people, which is important, but you have the necessary and proper clause and you have the interstate commerce clause. So what that means specifically, the 10th Amendment, there's a, there's, a, there's a list of powers that, that, that give the federal government that they can create laws over the states. As you know, marijuana is still federally illegal. So the federal government has rights to declare certain things, and one of those things is also war. Now, to collect taxes. Now here, to regulate interstate. When you get the Commerce Clause, Congress can write almost any law, the president can sign it, and the Supreme Court doesn't go against it. Very rarely do they. We can get into the Scalia debacle, and we're going to get into that. So, but now you know your first 10 amendments. You got it. Now you know it. All the, the, you know that the federal government has the right to declare war and the right to, to collect taxes and the right to regulate interstate commerce. I'm just, that's the charter. It's right there. It's, it's, I, I didn't, I, I didn't, I'm not even qualified to be on the same level as, as Charles de Montesquieu. <laughs> I'm only telling you what he said. So now, now this isn't the foundation of our whole country because now what this creates is a social contract. This right here, these 10 things, this creates Jean-Jacques Rousseau's social contract. That's what the first 10 amendments right there do. That's what they do. They make it, so this is now the rule of law that you and I all agree to respect, which is why we all have to pay taxes because it's right here in the 10th amendment. I don't like it. I especially don't like what it's spent on. But it's listed here in the 10th Amendment that if I'm going to be an American, this is what they, they I'm American. <laughs> Actually, you know, um, I wanted to hang up my grandfather's flag, but um, I got it out for him just in respect, Grandpa. God bless you, sir. That was on my grandfather's coffin in 2021. 20, so, yeah, and he served in the Navy, like his great grand, like his father, and like his father, and like his father, all the way to the Revolutionary War. I'm the only person who didn't serve. <laughs> in the military, but I have cousins who all served in the military, so uh, it was just a bad time for me to go to the military. Wasn't good. You wouldn't have gone either. <laughs> now that we look back on time, <laughs> no. So anyway, as we proceed down the line. Okay, now what's gonna happen from here is, is these, these, um, these amendments here, th that's one thing. And, and we live under, so now once we live under these 10 amendments, Rousseau's social contract then takes place. Because remember, in the Fourth Amendment, your freedom standards, right? You have the right to be secure in your home, your property. And that's a social construct of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's social contract. He's the one that writes that. That's how you have a Fourth Amendment right. Because Rousseau says that you have a right to property, and that's in your Fourth Amendment. You, you have that right. That's what Rousseau says. And now we live by that exact standard today. And then right here, so now we, we know about life, liberty, and property from John Locke, and now we know the social contract is actually really created, especially by the 10th Amendment, that's going to have laws. And what, what the social contract initially means is law and rule of law. There's going to be a rule of law that's going to be respected, and that's going to be under the 10th Amendment. So now there's one more level of governance in the United States of America, which is, so what, what this man here, uh, Thomas Jefferson, did with James Madison is they plagiarized Montesquieu's book that came out in 1750 in French, 1752 in English. Remember, the Constitution is written in about 
1760, 17, yeah, 1760, 1761 is when the Constitution is written. So that's not even 10 years, maybe 10 years after Montesquieu's book, The Spirit of Laws, come out. And if you guys haven't listened to Spirit of Laws on YouTube, you know, you should. And so, so now what happens here, though, is the very big twist on top of the social contract is going to be the separation of powers and ending slavery. This is what Montesquieu is known for. He's famous for this. Slavery has to come to an end. And this is his, his, his teachings. And that government has to be separated. And this is where you can just see the exact plagiarism from Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. That government has to be broken up into three branches. It has to go into three branches. It's a must. It has to be an executive, a congressional, and a judicial or federal branch of government for checks and balances on power. This is... This is on your poster, so you should be able to see this. This is, Mon this is Charles de Montesquieu. This is not James Madison, and this is not Thomas Jefferson, not at all. Charles de Montesquieu, and he only went by Montesquieu, but I just wanted to, but, you know, you could look up Montesquieu, and it's, you, you know, it's ubiquitous across the internet. It's always, this is his complete concept in the Spirit of Law's books. That's, you know... So now, remember what, what Montesquieu's principles are. His principles are checks and balances on power, and his principles are to end slavery. So, so imagine him as that person back in 1750 publishing that book. That's probably not a very popular idea. You, you're, you're taking my slaves? Charles? You're, you're, you're Charles? Mr. Montesquieu? You're recommending I get rid of my slaves, bro? And so Jefferson and <laughs> Jefferson and, and Madison are both slave owners. Now, here's the big discrepancy between the two of them, and you tell me which one you like better or you think is a better discrepancy, okay? They both have uh, uh, slave women. It's, I, I don't want to get into it. You understand. And so... So now, Thomas Jefferson, he believes that black people are inferior to white people, that they're not as intelligent, they don't feel pain the same way, they're, they're, they're just, they're just a, a subspecies of man, even though they are man. And James Madison is, uh, 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 is, is, like, is like, no, 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 they're the same as we are, they're people, they have, uh, they're sentient beings, they love, they feel, they, 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 have, they worship God, all the same things, and they had this disagreement, and they both uh, owned slaves. Which one was better? The guy who, who knew that they were people and, and still do that way, or the guy who, who thought they were subspecies and, and did that? Woo! That's, you, 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 <laughs> you go round and round in your head on that one. Who's worse? Uh, I can't even put my head around it. But I also wasn't a product of that environment. Because as you'll read through the history of time, as you know, you know, I focus on Terry versus Ohio quite a bit, but there's a guy who, uh, uh, William O. Douglas, who wrote uh, uh, The Descent in Terry versus Ohio, and when you trace all of his cases back through the history of time, in today's version of the world, O. Douglas is on the wrong side of history on quite a few cases that would make you sick to your stomach. But, so you don't know what you would do. You don't know what you would do. If your family came over here and, you know, you have no idea what you'd do. It's like, go ahead and solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict at it, you know, while you're at it. Go ahead, tell me how you're going to fix it, American. <laughs> so, now, remember Montesquieu's main idea of, 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 a, of a, a try, check on power, governance, and the ending of slavery. Now, we're going to sign the, 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 the Constitution, the, 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 uh, the Constitution is going to get signed, ratified, and then ratified in 1791 here, and then in Marbury, so, so this, is, this, is, this is probably the, you know, who am I to talk, right? I'm just a, a, a nobody compared to the history greats. And so, so from one man's perspective, the judiciary wasn't really thought out completely properly. Because what happens in Marbury versus Madison is the judiciary takes the, the fundamental power to regulate legislation itself. 
the, the, we vote for the congressional branch of government. And in Marbury versus Madison, the Supreme Court pretty much said, we're gonna take the power to decide if your legislation's okay. <laughs> and so then when you listen to the Federalist Papers, when you get to Federalist 3, you hear that John Jay says, if we appoint the right men in the right places, you know, and they're using that voice and you're like, what? And you run that back like six times. And so, and, and so it's just gonna, like I, I, get, I get emotionally triggered, so I have to go back and look and try to keep track. <laughs> Like, that's emotionally triggering, that they just took all the power for the judiciary, the right to, to trump the legislation of which we vote for. We voted for that Republican. Republican means representative. So, so just guys remember that. When I say Republican, you're talking about the representative in exact historical context. They were Republicans. And they, they split into parties, the Bull Moose Party, the Whip Party, the Whig Party. There's all kinds of, you know, throughout history. And so, so now though, as we come down the line, oh, by the way, and this, this, is, this is Marbury from Marbury versus Madison. That, that's Marbury, that's, that's the guy right there who sued, who sued for his judgeship not being delivered to him. <laughs> that's the actual dude. It's crazy, we, I found an oil painting of him. Insane, that, that's the actual dude who created the, the most powerful judiciary in the history of time. This guy right here, Marbury. I mean, if it hadn't been him that sued, then Madison would have told him, uh, John Adams would have told him to sue someone else, you know, because John Adams, though, though, I don't want to get into the whole story because I want to walk down the line. Now, so now when we get here, when we get into Martin versus Hunter's Lisi, this is where the Supreme Court is going to take the power, and they're the only ones that can hear cases if they have anything to do with your constitutional rights where you agree to be governed under the social contract if the government defends these constitutional rights right here. That's what the social contract means. That's what rule of law means. That Jean-Jacques Rousseau's social contract says the government agrees to defend these civil liberties and I will agree to be governed. And so then in 1816 in Martin versus Hunter's Lisi, the Supreme Court says, we're the only people who can hear cases that involve your civil rights that involve the basic standards of life, liberty, ha you know, and property. The basic, the, basic, the, sta the standards that God gave you. Not, not that the nine unelected monarchs are, give you. So, so now, if your constitutional rights are violated, the only people that can hear your case is the Supreme Court. You can take it to federal court. There's a process. Uh, it's called... Um, exhaust administrative, you have to exhaust all administrative remedies, which is what I'm going through now in the state of Arizona, because I'm suing them for violating my constitutional rights. There's, you have to exhaust all administrative remedies. So, okay, now we continue. Um, so now, now the, the nine unelected people <laughs> who are super rich, that are, that are, their names are submitted by the, the by, by the, by the, <laughs> by the commerce, uh, Gosh dang it, I, I got, their names are submitted by the Federalist Society. It, it's just incredible. They're submitted by the most elite, of the, by the Bilderberg Group, by, gosh dang it, there's, there's a name I'm thinking of and I can't get it in my head. It doesn't matter though. So they, they, take, they take over our civil rights is the point here, and then certain groups supply their names of the super elitist who's going to do the bidding. And then here's crazy. In Johnson versus McIntosh, in this case on your poster, what happens right here is is this is the case that that I believe it's John Adams is is still the head of the Supreme Court. I'm pretty sure it is. And so so then he writes this big long winded explainer how our right. So let me just give you the background of the case. Johnson and McIntosh both sell land. One is being sold by a Native American, the other is being sold to a Native American. And so what happens is, is they say that Native Americans can't sell land. You can't buy land from Native Americans because it's not theirs to sell, it belongs to the federal government. And so now I wanna read you this because it's pretty specific. And it's from the 1452 palpable, P-A-P-A-L, Dumb diversity is a palpable issued on June 18, 1452 by Pope Nicholas V. It authorized Alfonso V of Portugal to conquer the Saracens and pagans and co-sign them to perpetual servitude. And this is the doctrine that Adams is going to quote in his decision. 
It's just incredible to me. It's just incredible. They, 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 oh, it, it'll piss me off if I get into it too much. <laughs> as, as you know, you know, I'm pretty fire passion. I'm pretty uh, fiery passionate guy when it comes to freedom and what your freedom standards really truly mean. You know, what, what's supposed to happen to you in real life is according to what the standards of the, the Enlightenment thinkers had in, in mind for you. And, and, and the idea that, that he would invoke a slavery doctrine to justify Johnson versus McIntosh, that Native Americans can't sell their land, we can't buy their land, uh, white people can't buy the land from Native Americans, only the federal government can sell land. It's just like, it's just disgusting. <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just nasty. And so, so you, you gotta kinda, and then when you, when you read it, Pope Alexander VI issued a palpable decree in which authorizes Spain and Portugal to colonize the Americas and its Native American people and its subjects. The decree asserts the rights of Spain and Portugal to colonize, convert, and enslave. It also justifies the enslavement of Africans. So, you know, this is, this is, this is not a great doctrine. This is not a great doctrine to be, like, quoting and being like, hey, you know, Pope Alexander VI issued a decree in which authorizes us to colonize the Americas, the Native Americans as subjects, and have total dominion over them. Their lands, all immovable objects and things and persons are now your subjects. I don't need to look at it, I've read it before. So, <laughs> so now remember, so now we're based on the fundamental principle of Montesquieu's checks and balances that we're gonna end slavery. And then in 1857, in the Dred Scott case by the Taney Court, you got Ivy League educated guys who say that, that Dred Scott's not a man, he's property. Right here. Right here. That, that Dred Scott's not a human being, he's property. What, what, are you, what, what are you doing here testifying? And what's the founding principle of our country? Montesquieu's checks and balances into end slavery. Montesquieu did more for ending slavery than any human ever alive in the history of all time. He's the grand Cuba of ending slavery. That guy right there, Montesquieu, he is. Credit this man. When you talk about slavery ending, thank you, Montesquieu. He's the guy that did it. And so now what happens? We, we, we have just, the, you know, John Jay, if we appoint the right men in the right places, and so, and, and, and just how long too? 1776 to 1857 is how long? How long is that? 75 years, give or take, 80 years. And it only takes 80 years for Ivy League educated men to declare that Dred Scott is not a man. He's property. What are you doing over here testifying? <laughs> how, how far away from, from life, liberty, and property, the social contract, the rule of law, and to ending slavery at all costs, are we by appointing nine unelected people? How close are we? How close to freedom? How close to liberty? How close to the actual founding of our... If I respect that you can collect taxes with the 10th Amendment, then you need to respect the rule of law, the natural law, that liberty is far-reaching, and that slavery's over, and we all agree to live by laws, including people in authority. This is the founding principles of America. And instead, we have an incarceration, I'm gonna get off track, okay. Okay, so then what happens? Then what happens? Well, of course, there's a civil war. There's a civil war. Now, you can, uh, the Dred Scott case was, was one thing, but truly, I, I think that the catalyst for, for the Civil War was Harriet Beecher Stowe's book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. That was the precursor to war. And I think that was uh, 18, 18, so, someone tell me that. What, what year was, was Harriet, was it 1852? Was Harriet Beecher Stowe's book Uncle Tom's Cabin 1852? I truly believe that when you, when you take a look at that book, um, that was the catalyst to war. That was the beginning of war. That was when, that was when North American full-grown men who had ranches and wives and husbands and, and daughters and sons and cousins and brothers and aunts and uncles 
when they read, because remember, back now, right now you guys can tune into YouTube. We can all hang out. And give me a roll call. Hit a one so I know everybody who's here. What's up, Farno? I just took a look at the screen. I added just real quick. So, so thank you, dude. Appreciate you. So, so, so back then, everybody read everything. Why do you think everybody was so religious for so long? Everybody read the Bible. Everybody read everything. They read everything. And so... And so now what you what you know people are reading that Dred Scott's not a man and so that's going to and, and so when when Harriet Beecher Stowe's book Uncle Tom's Cabin comes out and everybody says man you got to read this book it's crazy then everybody reads the book Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin everybody reads it and it, it per, per, portrays what it's like to be a slave in the south it's not good it's not a pretty picture so so I believe and so because though and and, and I won't give not credit to, to Dred Scott because this is what drove John Brown mad. And John Brown, as you know, John Brown is truly the catalyst for the Civil War. You know, he's best friends with Frederick o. Douglass. Frederick Douglass. He, this is, these two guys are best buddies. And when Dred Scott happens uh, here, sorry about that, when, when, when Dred Scott happens in 1857, you know, John Brown, he... he he, he goes to Douglas. I'm sorry, I'm looking at it backwards. He goes to Douglas and he's like, yo, let's, let's roll skulls. And Douglas is the voice of reason. John Brown's a madman. He's the guy that'll go into bleeding Kansas and kill five slave families, their sons, their daughters, kill the whole families. So that's another story. I don't want to get lost. So now as we keep going down, so now, you know, if you take a look at your graphic, when you look at your graphic, it, it, you should all have a poster. The free codes are everywhere. They're on every video I already posted. You guys should all have a free graphic that looks just like this. I've given away all the free codes. Uh, some of you guys have bought it. Thanks for buying it. Keep buying it. And those of you who can't buy it, don't buy it and get, get, use the free codes. But this is a digital download. And on the digital download, you will see when, you, when you're when looking at it, you'll see this graph here. And it looks a lot better on yours, actually. It didn't come out so good on the step repeat. It's OK. So now this graph right here is the lynching chart in America starting in 1882, 1882 and going all the way till 1965. And you go, man, how is there a lynching chart? Is that, think, just, think, just, just think about that. Just, just, just wrap it around your head for a minute. We have a lynching chart. Think about that. Sick, right? Sick. We have a lynching chart. And so you say to yourself, well, once again, you know, how did that happen? How did, how did we get a lynching chart where there, you start to chart how many? And by the way, there's, there's more lynchings in the past that I'll, I'll get into. But the way we have a lynching chart is from the Supreme Court. So Dred Scott was one thing, and that caused the Civil War. The Dred Scott holding caused the Civil War because people in the North were like, you know, Fugitive Slave Act was having people come up and they were getting drugged back down to the South and then they were getting hung. So the way it happened was called the Colfax Massacre. I don't know if you'll be able to see that. Let me zoom in on that. The Colfax Massacre right here. The Colfax Massacre happens in 1873. And this is where in Louisiana, the Republican and Democrat Party both claim ownership and winning of the governor's race. They both say that we run the governor's race. And so the Democratic Party back then was the KKK, and the Republican Party was for free black people. And so, so what happened was the Republican Party said, you know, we legitimately won, and they did. But then the Democratic Party said, no, we did. And then what happened was uh, the Democratic Party just slaughtered 150 people, you know, mostly black people. <laughs> True. And then what happened is um, then, of course, the reason why that's bad in 1873 was because in 1871, here, um, Grant passed the Enforcement Act. Mm -hmm. I think, was it, was it Grant? Your, pres your presidents are right here. Your, 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 pres your presidents on your graphic, you know, you, you may not be able to see this here. Yeah, you'll be able to see it. So right here, and I, I, I was correct. It's Grant. In 1871, it's Grant. And Grant, Grant passes the Enforcement Act in 1871, also called the KKK Act. And what it says is you can't kill black people to stop them from voting. <laughs> really. And, and then also creates the um, uh, Section 18.242, Deprivation of Rights Under the Color of Law. That's where that comes from. That's where that comes from. Your deprivation of rights under the color of law comes from the 1871 Enforcement Act that is reiterating the 1866 Civil Rights Act. But we're going to get into that in one second. So... Because I wanted to jump, I wanted to jump right up here to how we have that lynching graph. Is now when the Colfax massacre happens and those two political par parties, which is really called the KKK, and they kill 150 people, then it goes to the Supreme Court in a, in a case called Cruikshank. 
here, Cruikshank versus the United States. And in Cruikshank versus the United States, what that does is the, the Supreme Court, the, the nine unelected personnel who, who we don't have any control over, they have nothing in common with us, they make pretty much a statement in the holding that says, we cannot ensure your civil liberties. We can't do it because that 150, 150 people have been slaughtered. And then, then that sets off the lynching graph. That's how we have a lynching graph. Because you know when, when there's no rules and we can't enforce your civil liberties and we're not gonna, you know, you know, you don't have any rights. You, you don't have any rights and I hate you. You know, you, you get the rope, you get the rope. And then, you know, there's, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but there's, there's no more prevalent just historical data facts to that, to how directly the Supreme Court ties to a ruined America today than the 1833 case of Pace versus Alabama. And then, you, and then when you compare and contrast it to the lynching chart. So in the 1883, 18, 1833 case, did I say something else a second ago? I'm a little dyslexic. So the 1883 case of Pace versus Alabama created uh, interracial relationships when Orlando Pace was with Mary Cox and they were cohabitating. And the Supreme Court held in their supreme holding, supreme ruling, that you couldn't have an interracial relationship. Then, then, 1883, well then in 1884, in 1884, there was 160 white people lynched. In 1884, 160 white people. 1883, the Supreme Court said that you couldn't have interracial relationships. 1884, 160 uh, white people were lynched in America that the NAACP could, kept track of, meaning they got most of them, probably 200, right? We lynched some, some nobody, no one's gonna say nothing in that tiny little town. Just real quiet, just real quiet. So that's how you can see direct correlations to how the Supreme Court just decimates our country with bad holdings that are immoral and disgusting and just downright despicable. Despicable. And so, and so now as we continue down, so you know, this is where after 1865 and 1866 you had the now this Civil Rights Act is is what we live under today. This is this is what starts the deprivation of rights under the color of law. Because 1865, black people are officially freed with the 13th Amendment, but that doesn't happen until 1964. And then what happens here is this creates your deprivation of rights under the color of law and also the beginning of equal protection under the law. Because the 1866 Civil Rights Act is going to turn into a version. It's a version of the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment, 1868, is going to say all persons are entitled to equal protection under the law. And as we talked about earlier, it says the same thing in the Fifth Amendment, the exact same 14 words. So, or 11 words, I can't remember exactly, but whatever. So, so, now, so now, when we pass the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, and this, this one's a little messed up because it's, it's, um, there's some sticking out here, you probably just can't see it. But in your 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment from, from 1865 until 1870, you know, 1865, 68, and 70, the, this little block of time right here, so the, the Congress, using Montesquieu's scale of checks and balances, the Congress, that we elect passes amendments, civil rights. They pass civil rights to protect people. And then right here in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, we voted for those in our Congress that we, vote, that we voted for, they upheld these. And then, hold on a second. And then what's gonna happen after, after that is the Supreme Court, the 13th Amendment is gonna be washed away with the slaughterhouse cases. You, you'll do slave labor. We'll use the 14th Amendment and say that you sign a contract, you'll work as much as they say, you don't have to sign the contract. It reinstitutes slave labor. 1876, that, that 15th Amendment, the, that, that these two women, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, these two women fought so hard to, to do. The Reese versus the United States, that wipes it right out with the, with the states can create barriers to voting. And they gave up their whole lot in life. And neither one of them saw women got the right to vote because they did it for black people. I'm not kidding. I'm not joking one bit. So now as we continue forward, uh, and, and so that wipes out your, your 15th Amendment, and then Cruikshank versus United States wipes out your 14th Amendment of equal protection under the law because we can't make the states enforce your rights. That's what that holding says. So your 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment are just wiped away by Cruikshank, Reese, and the Slaughterhouse cases, gone. And then in 1883, just, just to add insult to injury, just 10 years later, I hope you don't have a black husband or wife because if you do, we'll see you in hell. <laughs> it's just that simple. It's just that simple. 
I mean, we've never impeached anybody. Th this guy who, who, who wouldn't sign, who wouldn't, <laughs> they, they tried to impeach him because he vetoed bills, he vetoes the amendments, he vetoes everything. He's a horrible, horrible Andrew Johnson, the bottom rung. And, <laughs> and so these women give up, give, it up, give up their whole life's mission and then the Supreme Court wipes them away, wipes away your voting rights with Reese. It's gone, it's stupid. It's stupid. Oh shit, sorry about that. I was just trying to get that back so I could, so I could zoom back. I'm gonna need another one of these in a second. So, uh, it's, it's LaCroix. So, so, so now, so you see the damage, and so now what's the damage of that? Let me, let me give you the damage now that you, you, you've been locked in, you can see the cases that we pointed out, that we, we, we determine which case does what. Now you know which cases. So then you say, well, how long can this last? An unelected body of people who have nothing in common with you and I, who are passing immoral <laughs> holdings at our constitutional level that say man is property, that say we can't enforce your rights, that you know what, states can make barriers to voting, and that you know what, you don't have to do slave labor, but you have the 14th Amendment, the right to contract. You don't gotta sign that contract, but that's the only job. So. They even give a contract. Matter of fact, they even uphold the constitutionality of giving one slaughterhouse company the contracts for all pigs. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. It's incredible when you get into the case. And so now the consequences of that is that the, the Pace versus Alabama that, that, that's going to make interracial relationships illegal. And if you don't do it, baby, you'll do it. Okay, you, you, pretty soon you got your mom and dad going, please, please, please do not like that person, that black boy or black girl or white girl or white boy because you're gonna get me hung. And it, uh, so 1883, Pace versus Alabama, this lasts until 1967 in Loving versus Virginia. That's how long it lasts. What's 1883 to 1967? I'm not great at math, you tell me, 67, 87. Holy smoke, 77, it's what, 80 something years? 80 something years before all these guys here gotta be dead before these guys will overrule their shitty holding, their, their immoral, disgusting injustice. They all have to be dead before these unelected elitists will undo their bad holdings? Now here's the good news, just so you know. If, if you follow the secular hand of time and see how things are going, so we, we play that game here. You had, you had Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. Brown versus Board of Education is gonna desegregate America. Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, that's what's actually gonna create legal racism, legal segregation, legal segregation here. So how many years is that? 1896 to 1954, that's 58 years. Now, Terry versus Ohio's in 1968, we're in 2022. How many years is that? 54 years. We're on the 55 years now. We're on the cusp of change. We're, we're, on the, we're, on the, we're in the secular pattern, in the circular pattern to change Terry versus Ohio. We're up. We're up. We're due. We're due to get our rights back if you, if you keep track. Of, let me give you another one. So Plessy versus Ferguson. Now Reese versus the United States in 1876 is going to give states the right to limit your voting rights. That's going to be upended with the 1965 Civil Rights Act. The 1965 Civil Rights Act, 65, 76, that's 75 years almost, right? 65, no, it's more, it's more than that. It's almost 85 years before your rights are restored for voting. Now, that's going to be undone in the 2014 case of Shelby versus Holder. Do I have that on here? I don't know if I have it on this on this wall. It's the 2014 case of Shelby versus Holder. It's a uh, uh, that's Shelby County, Alabama versus Eric Holder in 2014. They sued to get out of. Just so you know, the 1965 Civil Rights Act. What it does is it doesn't. It's not just a a. It's it's the 1965 Civil Rights Act. What it does specifically, the inner workings of it, is it puts federal monitors in place in states where people could create barriers to voting or not do their job properly and make sure that some people don't get to vote. And so then in 2014, they're federal monitors. That's what they are. Federal monitors are going to oversee your elections. So then in 2014, in a case called Shelby, 
Shelby County, Alabama, which had been on the federal decree from 1965. They said, we don't want to be under federal decree anymore. We don't want federal monitors anymore. We'll, 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 and we'll, we'll do what we want with our voting. Because states do have a right in their state constitution to determine how people vote in their state. Every state can create their own constitution. It has to remain constitutional to give them a right to vote, but how they set up their voting procedures is another thing that can be changed within their state constitution. So in the 2014 case of Shelby versus Holder, they sued Eric Holder, Shelby County, Alabama did, and said, we want the federal monitors removed, and they won. So then what Alabama did after that is they then set up laws in their legislature, in the Alabama legislature, that was signed by their exec executive that said you couldn't get an umbrella in line, you couldn't have someone bring you water in line, you couldn't have someone hold your place in line. And what are you talking about when you get into the real freakonomics of Alabama? You look at the population of obesity, you look at the population of obesity in the black community in Alabama, was what I did, and what I started to see is there's a pattern here of people who are going to be less mobile, have less time, and then the state of Alabama, they closed lots of voting booths and then shortened the time window in which you could vote, meaning that you would be forced to be outside at some level in Alabama. Okay, I got to get something to make. So, look, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. I'm no smarter than anybody else. I'm just real curious about everything. I want to know. I want to know every single thing I can possibly know. I want to know everything. I'm interested in everything. There's nothing I'm not interested in. I'm interested in everything. There's nothing. So, that's what happens with Reese versus United States. And then you have uh, Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock. This is never going to be undone. You know what else? I'm sorry. I think it's covered here. I think this is Bad Elk versus the United States. I just had to get Rufus Peckham in there. That's Rufus Peckham. But Bad Elk versus the United States, it's in your ebook. And actually, I actually updated the ebook of Rufus versus the United States. Let's not get into it. This is Rufus Peckham. In the 1900 case of Bad Elk versus the United States, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a misprint here, but you have it on your poster. You can see it on the poster. It says Bad Elk. That's John Bad Elk against John Killsback, two Native American cops who will ultimately, Killsback tells Bad Elk, hey, listen, I'm going to arrest you. And, and, and John Bad Elk says, you don't have a warrant for my arrest. And then John Killsback says, pulls his gun out and says, you're coming with me. The two of them shoot each other. Bad Elk kills John Killsback. So John Killsback, these guys are both Native American. They've both chosen the name, well... Let's not get into that. John and, and John Killsback and John Bad Elk. John Bad Elk is charged with murder, but his case is granted certiorari all the way to the Supreme Court because the fact of the matter was John Killsback did not have a warrant for John Bad Elk's arrest. And if you go by the Fourth Amendment in 1900, it says no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause. And John Bad Elk did not have a warrant for his arrest. However... If you don't know something that's highly important, you have to understand that whatever the Supreme Court justices say, the Supreme Court, whatever they hold to be rule of law, is the actual Constitution. That's the new Constitution. That's why I keep saying we have to overturn Terry. But in the bad out case, common law states that if someone's going to arrest you without a legitimate warrant, you can kill them, and they, you, they die, and you're off the hook. However, the Supreme Court justices decided to downgrade John Bad Elk. He's a Native American in 1900. You think that the white Supreme Court justices gave two dams about this guy? So John Bad Elk, they say, well, common law says that, but instead what we're going to do is we're going to charge you with manslaughter, and then John Bad Elk will die in prison. But what Rufus Peckham says during this whole thing, his, what he says in his holding is that you are not allowed to resist police, which is why Bad Elk gets charged with manslaughter instead of getting off scot-free. He's not allowed to resist police. This is where 
resisting arrest comes from today, from Rufus Peckham. I just want to get a good look at him. Get a good, get a good look at Rufus. This guy right here, he decided that resisting arrest, that, that's resisting arrest. This guy right here, Rufus Peckham, that guy right there. This guy decided for all of us, you are not allowed to resist police. And that's what the, that's what the resisting police law is today, based, based on Rufus Peckham holding of 1900. It's never been undone. Instead, police creating policy around the right to detain you given to them by Terry versus Ohio have now de created detained policies, meaning handcuffs on your belly, on your knees, get on your knees. So we're going to go down the line here. And if you, if you if, so now these are going to be primarily just racist holdings. You know, Giles versus Teasley is going to be based on voting. Giles is going to lose. I believe someone told me it's Giles, Jackson Giles. He's going to lose and he doesn't get his right to vote in Alabama. Shocker, <laughs> shocker. He still sues the Alabama Board of, a, of Electors. But then right here is where I want to get 1913 case. And this is a case that not very many people know about. But if you're one of those people who says that you can't drive with the driver's license, which, by the way, that's on one of my motions that we filed for my ticket. <laughs> you don't have the right to tell me I have to have a driver's license. So, but this case here, the 1913 case, sorry about that, the 1913 case of Hendrick versus Maryland here, this is where it, each state is going to get the right to create traffic rules, regulations, laws, laws. They're going to be able to create laws through their own state legislature around your driving. That comes from the 1913 case of Hendrick versus Maryland. Not very many people know about this case. Not very many people have read it, but it's an easy read. This is, you should get into it. So now here, since we're here, I might as well just stick with it. United States versus Senec, very weird spelling. This is the case where have you ever heard the thing where they say you can't scream fire in a busy movie theater? This comes from the 1919 case of Cynic versus the United States. That's what that comes from. And this case that, that Cynic was based on, I, did I used to, do I have, do, do I have his, I don't think I have his picture. Do I have Cynic's picture? Charles, Charles Cynic and Elizabeth Bayer, the, the wife's name was Elizabeth Bayer. And in the 1919 case, you've heard you can't scream fire in a busy movie theater. Your First Amendment right is limited. What you may not have known, though, is that that saying comes through the media and through the government echoing back and forth with each other based on Charles Sinek and Elizabeth Bayer handing out pamphlets to men who were signing up for the draft to go to war. And on that pamphlet, it said, assert your rights, you're free. You don't have to go to war. You're not a slave. Because if you guys have ever seen, Bl was it Blitzkrieg? Or what was the name of that movie by the, I, I can't even. So, so now your First Amendment right, what, I, I want to stay focused on the story, forgive me. Your First Amendment, so now what they, what they do is they, by the time Senate gets to the Supreme Court with his wife, Elizabeth Bayer, they have, they're appealing to the Supreme Court certiorari. So that, so that they can get a writ of habeas corpus because they've been locked up for using their freedom of speech. And that's what they're applying to, to the Supreme Court. And then when they get to the Supreme Court, remember what they've done is handed out pamphlets saying, you know what they said. And the Supreme Court upholds their conviction. And then the newspapers in 1919, they're going to be ran by, I believe, the, the Hearst industry. And it then becomes a ubiquitous message across all newspapers, all publications in America, that your first amendment right is limited. You can't scream fire in a busy movie theater. The papers rarely will promote the holding that Cynic is his conviction for handing out pamphlets to say, don't go to war upholds the conviction against free speech. As a matter of fact, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who writes the opinion, who writes the opinion that you can't scream fire in a busy movie theater, that's his quote. 
all over Wendell Holmes. He's celebrated in Ivy League colleges. I've read what he's written. Not by me, he's not celebrated. Not by me, Oliver. I hope you're burning in hell. And so, so he was an abolitionist. He fought in the Civil War. He was 18 years old. He backed up Lincoln. He killed lots and lots of men. He then was promoted up through government very quickly because he's a war hero in the Civil War uh, on the side of the North. Anyway, I don't want to get into it. So he, he had written the opinion that you can't scream fire in a busy movie theater for a different case for the white court. Was it the white court? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think it is the white court. I think it is the white court. Because it's 1919. Yeah, it's, it's the white court. It, it is the white court. I, I can't stand being wrong. So, so now he's... He had written the opinion that, that he, because back then, remember, you guys go back and try to live back in time. Remember, you know, right now I have to be able to educate you guys and teach you guys in a really cool, interesting way for you guys to, right? So back then in those days, they would impress each other by how they wrote something out by how they wrote. Remember, FDR is going to court his cousin. FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt will marry his cousin, but he's going to court her by writing her letters, long love letters. That's what they did, these guys. That's what they did back in the day. Like, I'm an intellectual because I've read all these things, but what they did back in the day, they wrote. You didn't get to see everybody all the time. It wasn't that simple. Your letter would get there far before you, and you would end up dead if you went. So he writes this glorious opinion that gives the federal government power. And the Chief Justice White reads his opinion. I wish I could remember the case. He reads his opinion, and he goes, this is beautiful, Oliver. Can we save this for a more appropriate case? And they save the opinion of you can't scream fire in a busy movie theater, and they then apply that opinion to the Senate case, and that's what all the newspapers run with. You can't scream fire and your First Amendment right is limited. And of course, what do we say? Two things. We say, number one, the Supreme Court said, because we had this great admiration and reverence for this group of people who are elitist that we never met, have nothing in common with us, and are in charge of everything, of all of our being, all of our lives, our civil liberties, our civil rights. And we all ran around saying, the Supreme Court said, like they're great or something. And it's, it's, a, it's a ruse. They, they, they use the same opinion here with the other one, and then it, it goes out, and then you run around saying the Supreme Court said, and then the second said it, you say is that, yep, you can't scream fire in a busy movie theater. Yep. Number one, the Supreme Court said, and number two, you, yeah, you can't scream fire. Your First Amendment should be limited. You know, you, you shouldn't be able to scream fire in a busy movie theater. You know what I'm saying? Like, you shouldn't be able to do that. So you're walking around parroting tyranny, right? Because, look, you... <laughs> Someone screaming fire in a busy movie theater obviously is disgusting, uh, but that that shouldn't be synonymous with your First Amendment right is limited. That's not that th those two things shouldn't go together like gun law. They should never go together, right? So, so but the Supreme Court said, and this is this is the the BS story that these guys sell to us, and and that's how you 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 openly disparage your right to to to, to free speech. So as you know, the lynching chart is just chugging along, chug, 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 chug. The white bars are white people. A lot of white people got lynched, a lot of white people. And so then it slows down. The white people slow down right, right in here, 1904. You can see the drop where the white people drop. But in 1911, the black population of lynchings is down here. You see this? You see where the, the black population of lynchings around in the, in the early 1900s? Early 1900s for the black folks, as far as the lynchings are concerned, not a good time. And so a lot of the black folks, they're going to leave the South. They're going to take a bet. They're not, we're leaving. Boom. And they run up here to New York. They run up here to New York. And so when all the black folks get there in 1911, uh, Andrew Sullivan, the, Sol the Sullivan Act, the 1911 Sullivan Act is going to create the gun law that if you want to have a carry gun, if you want to carry a gun, you had to register with the president of the police bureau. And so this law of, of having to register with the president of the police bureau in 1911, and the reason why this is enacted is because the black people are moving to the city. <laughs> you guys can't carry guns. 
And this isn't going to be enforced, by the way. This is only going to be enforced against black people, just so you know, in 1911. But what do the white people do? Cool, Jim. You register your gun? I sure did. You register, sure did. But this guy didn't, right? And so, so it's only going to be enforced against black people. That's the nod and wink thing. It's going to be recognized by Justice Buford on the Florida Supreme Court later. You can look it up. He actually references it, that it was only supposed to be applied to, to black people. And so, so, but this, 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 get back to the wording of the 1911 Sullivan Act. Get back to the juice of it, the meat, the most important part. That, that if I'm going to carry a gun, I have to register my firearm with the president of the police bureau, get a license or a permit from the president of the police bureau. And what is the law today for me to carry a concealed gun here? Right here, I have to register with the president of the police bureau. A cop has to decide if I'm allowed to carry a gun. So if I walk in the door right away and I say, oh my God, I, I, now I'm forced to associate with, with police if I want to carry a gun? I, I have to? I just have to? Cops have to say I'm okay? That, that's, that, that. So if you guys have not read The Racist Origins of Gun Control, I have two different versions on my website, downloadable 100% for free. You know, uh, and, and listen, if you guys want to support me, I give away the poster for free. Use Overturn Terry versus Ohio. If you want to buy one, dude, buy one. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, get this exact poster on DeleteLaws.com. The codes are posted on my last video if you want it for free, if you don't got the 20 bucks. If you do, buy it from me, please. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, they're posted. Overturn Terry versus Ohio. Terry versus Ohio has to go. And uh, large overturn Terry versus Ohio poster. All those words together. Someone can type those in there for me. I'm sorry, guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bring me back. Bring me back to focus. I, I, my OCD is so incre incredible. So now, so now remember, so you got to get your gun from the president, please, bro. And now here is where things in America, just so you know, we got the 1919 case of Cynic, but then in 2020, in 1920, that is going to create the downfall of America. In 1920, the Volstead Act that is going to criminalize alcohol is going to be the downfall of our country and the beginning of absolute tyranny, the beginning of absolute loss of all rights. It's going to carry into the war on drugs. We're going to create the war on drugs. They're going to use the blueprint of prohibition to do that. And so what's going to happen here in 1920 is prohibition. Now, I can get into a bunch of these racist laws, but, but a couple of things happen here, right? This is a really shysty time in our country right here because you're going to have the red summer of 1919 where, so the, 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 you, you see it here. It's, it's, on your, it's on your graphic here. World War I is going to be from 1914 to 1918. And so in America, there's this really, it's not a great time. When millions you know, of people around the world are dying, things are not like a hunky-dory, lovely time. They're not great. And so when, now what happens, though, in the Red Summer is two different things. After the war ends, you have 350,000 black troops coming back who have learned how to run. You know, World War I, truly, just so you guys know, is the reason why we don't have slavery in America today, World War I. Because black people, black men and, and some women too, went into the military. I don't think women could serve back then in World War I. So, so, so they went into the military, and for the first time when they went over and fought World War I, they had other people treating them, the other countries, because they, they wouldn't serve under, under white commanders. They only served under, under other commands, you know, under the French, under the English. They didn't, the, but white commanders didn't lead black troops in World War I, they were led by other countries. Really, look it up. And so, so, so then what, what happens here, when they get back in 1919, you have a lot of young black men coming back from war where they were respected for four years, three years, two years, one year, it doesn't matter, one month. And then when they come back, they stand up for their rights, and it is just a whitewashing. Lots. I, I mean, how many, how many people were actually slaughtered in 1919? I don't think we'll ever really know that number. You know, I think it was really bad. But I think at the same time, though, it sent this shockwave through the entire culture that the, the ways of oppression and, and the disgusting, it was going to have to change, and it was going to change soon. And Earl Warren, I think, is going to see the writing on the wall, and that's why he's going to desegregate in 1954. But 
what also is going to happen here in 1920 is the building of the prison industrial complex. Before that, listen, you could say that, you know, I did a long lecture on prisons. Uh, it's on this channel. You guys can watch that lecture on prisons. But the truth is, is that the industrial prison complex, the real rise in prison where you went from the tens of thousands to the hundreds of thousands happened from 1920 to 1933. And if you, if on your wall graphic, on your, on your poster, you'll see if you look at right down here, let me, let me lower this down. There it is. Sorry. Whoop. Let me grab my stick here. There we go. This makes it a lot easier. Sorry, guys. So, you know, you're going to have the... So, you know, right here, you only got thirty to 40,000 people in prison, you know? And yeah, they're mostly black, but the... And, 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 and you know, you go back and we... I'm not going to do a history of prisons right now. But what happens here is... Um, you're going to take, you know, 30, 40,000 people in prison and you're going to go up to over 150,000, 200,000 people in prison by the time prohibition ends. You know, and a lot of people will go down Woodrow Wilson will go down in history, definitely uh, you know, not a lot of great things to say about him as far as but he was super smart. He said that if we criminalize alcohol, you're going to create a criminal industrial system and he did. He was right. He vetoed the Prohibition Act. He said, no, I'm not going to sign the 18th Amendment and Congress using Montesquieu's checks and balances, they overrode his his veto. And so that did indeed create the prison industrial complex. And it's going to go and go and go. But not till Terry versus Ohio is it going to go like a mountain, right? <laughs> I mean, it's going to go like a mountain at Terry. But I don't want to jump ahead. But this is the beginning of the prison industrial complex. So this time period right here, though, what it's going to do is create laws that are still on us today. We still live under the laws of prohibition from 1920 to 1933. And we know that from nothing more than the Carroll, the U.S. United States versus Carroll in 1925. And I've done long lectures just on Carroll, so I'm going to gloss over it now. But what Carroll does is this is based on Oklahoma prohibition law. There's an Oklahoma prohibition law here. And they're going to go all the way to the Supreme Court, and they're going to uphold that you're allowed to search someone's car without a warrant. That's what Carroll does. That the police, because alcohol, because a mandate has passed, again, I did an hour-long lecture on mandates, because a, a, a mandate has been passed, what's going to happen here is they're going to create the exigent circumstances clause, better known as the Carroll Doctrine. And if the police believe there's going to be a loss of life, if the police believe they're in hot pursuit, or if the police believe they need to seize evidence off of you, they can just skip your rights. They skip your rights. Your rights are skipped. The Bill of Rights that I've been talking about the whole time is just skipped if the police believe these things. Because the mandate to push everybody to do something that they don't want to do is never more prevalent than in Carroll versus the United States when nine unelected people decide that police have the right to search your car without a warrant in case they need to get evidence off of you, in case there's going to be a loss of life. And who determines that? The police, the same guy who used to do lawn care, the same guy who has no other skills, the same bonehead who, who is, is the dork in high school, the reject is this guy's going to decide if he's in hot pursuit of you. And this is based on, just so you know, the reason why hot pursuit is in there is because the police said they'd been pursuing the Carols forever. They've been pursuing them and trying to get them. The Carols, it was a scam. The whole thing was a scam. The whole thing was a scam. But that's where we get, and what's on the books today, what is still on the books today? What is, what is, what is still on the books today? The, the exigent circumstances clause is still on the books today. This still is on our books today. The cops can no knock, just just no warrant, just search you, just just search you because there's going to be a loss of life. They need to see evidence. And just so you guys know, I, the reason why this passes is because in 1924, when J. Edgar Hoover is appointed to the FBI as the head of the FBI, he begins to poison bottles of alcohol because they can't beat prohibition, because the cops are doing all of the smuggling, but because they can't beat prohibition, they cannot beat it. And so he's poisoning kegs, he's poisoning alcohol. So every now alcohol becomes an exigent circumstance. Because anytime alcohol is involved, there could be a loss of life. And they need to seize that evidence off of you. Because a mandate that was pushed for 100 years, by the way, based on the temperance society. So, how long am I here? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry for talking so long. But I just want, I wanted to give you guys a, a rundown on your poster here. Because I want everybody to have one of these. I really do. So that'll, that'll help you guys be more motivated to learn. And if you do get one for free from me, then you're obligated to get it printed out because you're going to figure it out. And I'm going to call Vista Print and try to get a deal where they give us a bunch of coupons or something. That's what I'm going to do next. So um, 
let's keep going. I'm gonna, what are we at, 79 minutes? I'll, I'll keep going for um, 11 more minutes and then I'll stop. Okay, so. But this is the, the downfall of our country, Carol versus United States. That, that's, you know, you know, in the four cases that we're gonna overturn, we're first gonna go Terry because I'm gonna become executive of California and I'm gonna outlaw it. And we go to Terry and then we go to Kerr versus California and then we go to Berniger versus the United States and then we go back in time to Carroll versus the United States almost probably 100 years later, 100 years later. And because the Carroll Doctrine, you, you, that's the reason why your car gets searched on the side of the road in case you didn't know. That's the reason why. So, so now, now, as we move forward here, you're going to get the, the National Firearms Act in 1934 that's going to create legislation that creates gun laws. <laughs> and why do they create gun laws? Because, oh, sorry about that, because they're afraid. They're, it, it, it's, it, the, the 1934 National Firearms Act is based on what? Prohibition. When they prohibited an alcohol that everybody wanted, everybody in America, half of Americans more probably back then, because when you make something illegal, then people really want it, right? And so, so half of America revolted, and it created these brutal alcohol gangs that would go to any extent to kill each other, and the cops were the biggest gang, in case you didn't read the Wickersham Commission. And, and so it creates this horrific culture society. I believe it's like one in six people will be hurt, killed, or somehow badly affected. I think it was hurt or killed, to be honest but I don't want to misquote a statistic, but I, one out of six people will be badly affected by the alcohol industry, badly affected. One out of six people. So not your family, your neighbor, you know, her dad died. It's like, there's just like, the, 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 when you think about it, it's staggering. And so the whole time this is happening, as we're going through prohibition, this guy, Harry Anzinger, he's watching the whole thing happen. And, and, and so Earl Warren, he's watching the whole thing happen. He's watching this whole thing happen. He's watching everything unfold. And you can say what you want about Earl, and you can say what you want about Harry Anslinger. These two guys are absolutely despicable. We can only pray to God that the devil has them both. <laughs> because they're despicable people. Just, just, just despicable. Despicable people. It, it, it really is despicable who they are. And so... And so what you're going to have here is you're going to get right after prohibition, the 1914 Harrison Act is going to make it so you have to have a prescription from your doctor to get a prescription medication. And what will happen from there is there's no teeth to this. There's no, there's no enforcement to this. You have to get a prescription from your doctor, but there's other people who are watching uh, prohibition happen through the 20s, and they remember the 1914 Harrison Act made you get a prescription for your for your medication. And so then in 1930, with the Federal Narcotics Agency is gonna be created and appointed to the head of the Federal Narcotics Agency is gonna be a guy named Harry Anslinger. And Harry Anslinger is then gonna push through uh, the 1934, do I have it on here? The 1934 Uniform State Narcotic Act. And that's gonna come in 1934 by Harry Anslinger. And, and he's not the guy, obviously, so he's head of the Federal Narcotics Agency, but what's gonna happen is, is in 1934 here, you're gonna have inside of, in, inside of, you know, Roosevelt, just so you guys know, I'm, I'm sorry to say there's, there's some, there's, there's, when you are a leader at that level that Roosevelt was, there's gonna be some fatal flaws about you that people find out about you later. And so what had happened was, um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he had appointed Andrew Mellon to be the head of the treasury. He was the secretary of the treasure. And Andrew Mellon diversified his money. And he diversified his money into Lamont DuPont and William Randolph Hearst. He diversified his money into these guys and to John D. Rockefeller. He, didn't have, he, he diversified his money. And Harry Anzinger became his heir. And then... When these two guys die in the same year, uh, Andrew Mellon and John D. Rockefeller, they're both going to die the same year as the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act. Both these guys are going to die on that, on that year. Then Harry Anzinger becomes the main star player of all drug enforcement, and he becomes, the, he becomes the leader, essentially, because all of his mentors and all of his rich men are now gone. And so he's the runner. He's the guy. 
And so what he's trying to do is trying to make sure that his family's inheritance in DuPont and in Hearst and in the fossil fuels of John D. Rockefeller, that he's going to make sure that he enriches himself and his family. And so now I, I don't have a lot of things on this poster, but I'm just going to let you delve in here. So there's going to be something created called the League of Nations. And the League of Nations is every industrialized democracy country after 1914 and 1918, World War I, you're going to have the League of Nations is going to be created as a defense mechanism to Hitler. And this League of Nations is going to bond together and they're going to agree to a lot of set of laws. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that Harry Anslinger was also a war hero. He was stationed at the Hague. He, when he got there in 1914, he, he learned German and infiltrated the German army, and he became a double agent for America. This, this is just some, some stuff about Harry that I learned over just researching him. And so he is no dummy at all whatsoever. This guy is sharp as a tack. And so then those years after World War I, where we, where we get into, um, I'm sorry, I got lost on Harry. <laughs> where, where was I? Tell me, tell me where I was. I was Harry, he was, um, oh, so, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. So, so now when he, when he becomes the, in 1930, let me just go right back to here. In 1930, when he becomes appointed to the Federal Narcotics Agency, it's because he has friends in powerful places. He's been around for a while, and he's super sharp, super sharp. And then in 34, he's going to create the Uniform State Narcotic Act. And then after those guys die in 37 and they pass the Marijuana Tax Act, then what he's going to pass is the 1934 State Narcotics Act. And a lot of states at that time, they don't want to adopt it. They don't want – they already just went through, through 13 years of prohibition, 12 and a half years of prohibition, and they've already seen enough death and murder and these things of prohibiting something. But soon, when Nixon's going to declare war on drugs in 71, what's going to happen here is, is they're going to adopt, a lot of the states are going to start to adopt the Uniform State Narcotic Drug Act. And his main thing is that the League of Nations, led by John D. Rockefeller's in the 20s, they're, they're, at that time, there's a big competition going on between fossil fuels and this other fuel called hemp. Matter of fact, they, they look over and they see Mexican hemp and Indian hemp in the League of Nations. And then John D. Rockefeller gives $10 billion to the Museum of Cairo, $10 billion to Egypt. And then Egypt takes their direction towards fossil fuels. And so you say he gave $10 billion to the museum. And Harry Anslinger, he's heir to the throne of all this money. He has all these connections where he has all this money tied up. So he makes it, when they hear about marijuana being this, this hemp thing that can grow wood and paper, then Harry Anslinger, especially when those guys die, but before, he makes it his personal mission to make sure marijuana is public enemy number one. And he creates movies about it and all this horrific stuff. But this is how, right here, Prohibition does this. And then Anslinger and uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, then they're arresting people here throughout the 30s, and they're, you know, they're trying to ensnare uh, black people, jazz musicians, they're trying to get anybody. But, but really, I can get lost on a whole dissertation here. On, let's just keep going. And so now, when we get here, when we, so when, we, when we get up to here, this is what's gonna, this is gonna be the pinnacle of Harry Anslinger's real career and everything that he's done to make sure America could be ruined. <laughs> sorry, sorry to end on a high note here. But so Kerr versus California. Now, Brinegar is disgusting. Brinegar is where it says a man of reasonable caution who has reasonably trustworthy information can just walk into your house. That's Brinegar. Really, really bad. I don't, I, because I only have a little bit of time left. I've been on here forever. And so, so Kerr versus California, though, truly, just so you guys know, this is the case that allows police just to knock on your door, announce, and come running in. And that happens, though, because of the Uniform State Narcotic Drug Act of 1934. Because Harry Anslinger, when he was at The Hague in World War I, he had made buddies with this new organization called the World Health Organization. So then in 1961, Harry Anslinger invites everybody around the world that he knows from the League of Nations to the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. He invites the World Health Organization, 
and he invites all the countries that America has defeated in World War I. And so, in World War II. And what he's going to say here is that we want to criminalize marijuana, and the reason why is the World Health Organization says that marijuana will cause your kid to be an axe murderer. With one puff, it can make you comatose. And the World Health Organization recommends that all marijuana plants are eradicated within 25 years of the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. That's a recommendation from the World Health Organization. You can look that up. And so this then, this single convention on narcotics drugs held in New York, also there are cops. Lots of cops, lots of cops. And so, so then right here in 1963, when they're pursuing the Kurs for being mar narcotics dealers, marijuana dealers, which is just preposterous, then they, they are chasing the Kurs around and they, the Kurs get to their house and they're secure in their house, but not in their car, as you know from the Carroll Doctrine. And so, but they think they're transporting marijuana and the single convention on narcotic drugs made marijuana an exigent circumstance. The World Health Organization said it can make you comatose. It could kill you. You could, you could turn into an ax murderer. This is the World Health Organization. So in Kerr versus California, the circumstances have become exigent. And now we need to come into your house. Now, there's marijuana in there. That's the holding. That police can enter to your house if they knock first. Common law principle. The police only need knock and announce their presence before they enter into your home. What's that based off of, though? Kerr versus California, which is based off the 1934 Narcotics Act, which is based on the 1914 Harrison Act. The 1914 Harrison Act is based on the 1911 breakup of Standard Oil. When Standard Oil is broken up, the fossil fuel industry, J.D. Rockefeller owned it all until it split into a million pieces. Then you had a bunch of families of wealth and, and, and influence and, and highly educated people who now owned a subsidiary of J.D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Corporation. And these are the folks who looked over the, at Indian hemp and Mexican hemp and they said, wow, that hemp is really great. It grows in a year and, and man, but we own a fossil fuel company here. Then came the 1914 Harrison Act. The, the elitists told the congressional uh, gr branch of government to write legislation that would make it, and on the 1914 Harrison Act, for the first time, is a new product called cannabis. This is, you see, do you see, do you see what happens here? Without it breaking up, maybe cannabis is not on the 1914 Harrison Act. But when you have a bunch of rich, educated people who see that hemp could compete with the fossil fuel industry, then it becomes where you have to have a prescription for marijuana that grows outside as a weed. It grows abundantly, it grows great, it, it harvests every year, it's amazing. And we don't know what the benefits are health-wise, long-term, especially for people who have epilepsy. We have no idea what this could do. And so when you jump forward, you, you think, you know, you, you're always thinking, I showed you cases that overruled other cases, but the, the thing about chemicals is it just gets worse and worse and worse. It just continues to get worse. Because then when you're up here, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have uh, the, you're going to have Kerr versus California, which is really, if just so you know, right this second, let me just give you, let me give you some facts here. Right this minute, if the cops get an address, it's your address, but it's the wrong address, just say. They only need to knock, 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 police, police, police. They don't have to say it that loud. Like Izzo said on the cop interview I did, they knock on the door, police, 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 and then boom, kick your door down. The cops can come to, right this minute, just so you know, the cops could be at that door right there, tapping on the door, police, police and I don't answer because I don't hear it, and then they can, bam, kick the door down. That's, that's, that's Kerr versus Cal. If you guys saw that video recently, Inspire Bus, they used a Kerr knock. They used a Kerr knock. They knocked on the window of the bus on Inspire Bus, and they did a Kerr knock. They knocked on the window and said, hey, um, where do you want to come in? They announced themselves. 
those 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 police who did that to the the guys the kids on the bus with the adult they followed the 1963 protocol of Kerr versus California it's it's the protocol this is the this is the law those police when they hit that those people's bus if you don't know the story it's a family of a priest and his wife I don't know what kind of priest he is whatever uh, and he marries people and, and there's four children and they're on a bus on property and the police get a search warrant for that property for the guy who owns the property it's not them though they're broke down there and then they do a cur knock and announce on the bus and they're screaming get out of here they treat these family like they're drug dealers see what I said like murderers that's a better way to put it so this is what allows them to knock and announce now this is common law just so you know common law common law is not a a, a, a substantive process law it's a judicial process law there's a difference between a substantive law and a, and a and a common law a substantive law and a common law are two different ways to rule common laws before the Bill of Rights before the Constitution which creates a set of procedures that have to be done that are based on common law Substantive law is based on the conditions of the human being that the law is being subjected to. And so Kerr versus California is based on common law, that the procedure is that police only need to knock and announce. It's not based on substantive law. There's a very big difference. The stare decisis, the case precedence of Terry versus Ohio, is listed as the common law of Kerr versus California. So then we jump right over here to, to, to Terry versus Ohio, and this is the beginning of absolute, total, and complete loss of all of your amendments. All This is Cruikshank of 1868 in 1968. History is cyclical. Cruikshank ended all of your rights. Terry versus Ohio ends all of your rights. Your First Amendment gone to be press. If you're someone filming cops, you can be arrested. Speech, he, he, he wants to talk, you better shut up, he's going to cop explain to you. Take away your right to assemble, your right to petition, your right to religion, all gone over COVID. Exigent circumstances dictate that you have no First Amendment rights. Second Amendment right to carry a gun, show the cop you got a gun, see how it goes for you. Your Fourth Amendment right to be secure in your person, houses, papers, and effects, you're secure in your person? No, you're not. Your Fifth Amendment right to not answer questions is subjugated when the Supreme Court says they can detain you to ask you questions. So how do you have a Fifth Amendment right if they can detain you to ask you questions? Your Sixth Amendment right to face your accuser? There is no accuser. The cop swears he's reasonably suspicious of you, and that's why you have to be detained, that magical space where they can question you. Now the cops are including policies that make it so it's torture for you. Your Seventh Amendment right, that you will have a jury trial if you do more than $20 worth of damage? Nope. You may face a jury anyway, because the cop is upset with you, and you're in contempt of cop. You're resisting arrest. What? $20 worth of damage? Nope. Nope. Your Eighth Amendment right to cruel and unusual punishment, that ended with Terry versus Ohio because the cop can detain you for his safety. Officer safety is paramount. You don't have an Eighth Amendment right not to be tortured. Your unenumerated rights of freedom, liberty, gone. Gone. Your rights are gone. Everything's gone because of Terry. So, anyway. Uh, yeah, listen, if, if you guys want to support me, buy my book, buy my poster. It's on deletelaws.com with a Z. I appreciate you guys coming. If you can't support me and buy the poster, the, the codes are Overturn Terry versus Ohio. Terry versus Ohio has to go. And large Overturn Terry versus Ohio poster all together. And VS, you guys can type it in the comment section there. Please share that with anybody else who doesn't have the 20 bucks and wants a poster because the poster is badass. You just got to work hard and, and try to save up for the next couple weeks if you're on fixed income. A lot of people on fixed income want posters. Save up over the next couple weeks and get the poster printed out for me so that we can see it on your wall. You can talk about it with your friends and I'm going to teach you every single thing on it. I'll teach you every single thing on it. I'll teach you the history of every person here. So that's what I can offer and that's 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 what I offer. And so that's, that's I, guess that's, I guess that's who I am as a person. <laughs> I mean, that's where, I, that's where I'm at. This is, this is, because listen, if, if you guys know your rights like I know my rights, then we can make a difference. And I have to run for governor and I have to win. I have to run for governor and I have to win. I have to win the executive of some place to change the police industry. I'm going to lay that out for you guys when I'm in Minnesota, because I'm going to probably do it right in front of the Minneapolis Police Department. But I, I, I want you guys to see the change in police the way it should be done. There's a real simple way. It, it just took a lot of years to think up and figure out how to do it. TAC coin looks like the drop date is February 24th. February 24th is what it looks like when TAC is coming.
You guys hit the number one button. Where's everybody at? Let me see. And then I'll, I'll get the flock out of here. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry, 100 minutes. But this has been really educational. Um, uh, make sure you guys get my poster, get my ebook. Please make sure you get my poster, get my ebook. They're both for free right now. Get them so you can follow along at home. You know, so at least you can follow along at home. You know, if you can follow along at home. And let me know in the comment section your city, state, and where you're from. So if you want to, you can say America if you want, or Canada, or Australia. But just let me know if you're watching the video where you're watching from, because then I kind of get a perspective. Because I go back and I read the stuff, and I, I, I can't watch all my content. I'm busy creating new stuff. But, uh, I love talking to you guys, man, and I love educating with you guys. And a lot of people correct me. If I'm incorrect on anything, remember, I'm talking fast. There's a lot of information going through my head. I may make mistakes. I'm human. There it is. <laughs> There's my disclaimer. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty close. I get a little dyslexic on the years and stuff, and some things I mess up. But, but for the most part, I'm pretty... I don't say anything I don't know about. Get me going on William Howard Taft. Boy, whew, you want to see a negative downturn. Talk about William Howard Taft, Delaware and the hizzy. You guys, thanks so much. Oh, you guys, hit the like button. Uh, hit the like button if you would, everybody. There's 300 people here. Just just hit the like button for me. Just just tap it like that. Just reach over and it's like it's right down there. Just hit your thumbs up button if you would, pretty please, with cherries on top. And then um, I appreciate that. And I should probably get out. I've been on for almost two hours. Um, I'm going to go over on the next one. I'm going to go over... Terry versus Ohio because we stopped here and believe me I skipped a lot of stuff on the poster but um, on Terry versus Ohio uh, here this is where we stopped but we definitely have to go back and cover map versus Ohio we definitely have to go back and cover Caroline products but then after that we're gonna move forward and we're gonna move into the jurisprudence and the stare decisis of the Supreme Court cases and then exactly you know the ramifications of what that has been of allowing police to to demand a, a detainment of you, and how many of these people that you've heard of have been have been killed on a Terry stop, and that's you know that's that's where we get to, that's where we get that's where we get. So yeah, good stuff. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for let me let me rattle a little bit. Um, you guys tell Brian at High Impact Flicks. I can't wait to have that uh, discussion with you about. Uh, natural law, the social contract, and checks and balances versus um, um, volunteerism or anarchy. I have a lot of respect for Brian over there. Super grateful to him. Thanks for, thanks for making me um, work harder and better to better educate people. Because when everybody knows the, the, the historical facts and the, the actual application of how laws were created, then we can start to have a bigger discussion about how to undo those unjust and, and, and you know, morality is a social construct based on the social contract. So because I know that, it's hard to say based on morality, based on the ethicalness of law. Because morality, as you will find out by reading anything about Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the social construct, uh, social contract, Jean-Jacques Rousseau will say that morality is a social construct. You're born beautiful. You're born perfect. You're born amazing. You're born as all of God's divinity going through you. And what happens when you enter into the social contract, the rule of law, where there is everybody has the right to life, liberty, and property, well, that third one is going to make it so that there's going to be the haves and the have-nots. And, and Rousseau recognized it right away. And he said that if there's going to be people who have and people who have not, then what's going to happen is you're going to create a hierarchy system based on wealth. And so you're then going to create somebody who will lie, cheat, steal, and maybe kill for the basic necessities that the social contract is supposed to uphold, protection, food, warmth and shelter. And if the social contract doesn't uphold protection, food, warmth and shelter, well, then the social contract's been violated. I've agreed to live under a series of laws and not just pitch a tent out in the woods. I guess that's kind of a dated philosophy, isn't it? I've agreed to live by a series of laws and not mug people and take their belongings because I live under the rule of law. If the government fails to uphold someone mugging me and taking my wallet, well, then the social contract has failed. 
Thomas Hobbes will say you should not overthrow a government because the social contract has failed unless your fellow man attacks first. Rousseau will say that if you are to violate the laws of the sovereign, then you should be put to death. <laughs> now I'm just kind of dumping stuff out on you guys. All right, anyway. Anyway, I, I could sit here and talk all day about history and our laws and our country. So anyway, you guys, thanks a lot for the support. Thank you for the love. I appreciate it. I hope you guys all learned something. Um, yeah, yeah. Any questions, you guys, I can't answer all emails. I'm trying. There's just a lot, and I love you guys. Thank you for sending me these videos. The gentleman who sent me the video of that cop being put in cuffs, thank you so much. And I made him jump through hoops because I don't just accept um, links from everybody. If I look, I just, I just can't, you know what I mean? People are trying to fish me and spam me and hack me all the time. So I just don't want to get fish spammed or hacked. Anyway, all right, all right. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you guys. And uh, let's, uh, let's reconnect uh, tomorrow. Um, I, you know, let's reconnect tomorrow. Let me get the flock out of here. <laughs> all right, I'll see you guys soon. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you. Uh, go by deletelaws.com and get the downloads of all the things I talked about the Mullen Commission, the racist origin of gun control, the poster, the ebook. Go get everything. All right, love you guys. Thank you. Appreciate you. Later.